All right, let's get it going. Welcome, welcome everyone, and welcome to Book Mecca's first showcase for stellar Black authors and their stories. My name is Shaylin Scott, founder of Book Mecca, and Book Mecca is an online platform and bookstore that highlights Black literature, Black authors, and Black stories. We amplify and highlight our voices. And I recognize that readers struggle to find written stories and experiences that not only speak to them, but are also written by us and for us. I'm passionate about bringing awareness to Black literature and authors, but also about ensuring our stories continue to be told for generations. Now, Toni Morrison once said, your life is already artful, waiting, just waiting for you to make it art. And today you'll hear firsthand from a rising author, Kendra Allen, who's turned her life into written art. And so I wanna definitely introduce the fabulous Kendra Allen. Before we get started on our interview today, I'll tell you a little bit about her. So she is an author of the essay collection, When You Learn the Alphabet. Get this book today, run get that, definitely. She won the 2018 Iowa Prize for Literary, literary Nonfiction and is quickly rising in the ranks of notable authors. She's born and raised in Dallas, Texas, born and bred Texan here, and holds a master's in fine arts from the University of Alabama. So welcome, welcome, Kendra. Thank you for coming on our show today. Thank you so much for having me. I've been like preparing for this in my head, like answering potential questions to myself about like, Kendra, okay, don't stutter, don't rant, because I rant a lot. So I've been practicing. But thank you so much for having me, oh. uh, for thinking of me, for being so kind to me. Uh, I'm really happy that this is happening. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And if you guys didn't know, we didn't prepare too much with questions. So I'm gonna hit her with the hard Oprah questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, definitely, let's get it started. So Kendra, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? What high schools and things did you go to school? Um, well, I decided like, I grew up in Dallas because me and my mama moved literally every single year of my childhood. So we've lived all around Dallas. We've lived in Pleasant Grove, Mesquite, Garland, um, everywhere. But if I have to think about like where I grew up, I'm always thinking of coming of age stories. For some reason, these are my favorite stories to tell. Um, if I have to think about where I grew up, I would say I, I literally grew up and came of age in Oak Cliff. Like my mom worked at the VA up the street. So I went to school there all the way up into high school. I went to Elijah and Peace um, Elementary. Yeah. I was at Cummins Rec every single day after school up until like middle school where I went to uh, Maynard Jackson uh, Middle School. I went there for elementary then they switched it to a middle school. So I went there for like five years. Um, and that's literally like where I grew up and where I learned what I was good at. Um, people I love, friends I made. And then I went to high school and um, at Skyline High School. And I had- Skyline, all right, all right. Yeah, okay. I had to sort of like recreate everything I knew. It was so big. I went to a very small middle, like middle school, like it's a square. I know everybody that I go to Skyline, it's like a college. And I'm like, all right then, um, what I'm gonna do. But <laughs> um, yeah, I went to high school at Skyline. Okay, all right. So you guys hear that. She is a born and bred Texan, Dallas, Texas native. So if for any other reason you're not getting her book, get it now. Yeah. Run, get that. So I would say, um, since you grew up here in Dallas and in the Texas area, where'd you go to college? Did you? I, went to I know school, you got your um, master's. I went to undergrad in Chicago to like this art school called Columbia College Chicago. Everybody, when I say I go to Columbia, they'd be like, New York and I'm like no nah, I went to art school <laughs> like I wouldn't have made it and no regular regular like undergrad program I went to art school to avoid taking math classes on purpose so so how did you get into writing um I've read a lot I think that's like what got me into writing without me knowing that I was getting into writing I would read all the time and looking back I think I read so much 
especially like during school days because I had like anxiety. Mm -hmm. High school, especially like when I went from middle school, I was like very outgoing. Then when I got to high school, I didn't really know nobody there. So I used to just read every day in class to like avoid having to talk to people. But I read up until that point all the time anyway. I was reading all my mama books on the shelf, whatever stuff I shouldn't have been reading. I was reading like Eric Jerome Dickey. And, um. <laughs> I was reading like wild stuff that I had no business reading. Uh, the coldest winter ever. That was like my favorite book, Fly Girl. Um, and I think I came to writing through sports. I always tell this story. I was on the tennis team at uh, Cummins Rec in Oak Cliff. And my tennis coach, uh, in order for us to get into competitions, we had to write like essays. And he had me write an essay on like the first black tennis player. I forgot his name. Uh, but he had me write it. And then I wrote it. And he was telling everybody, he was like, Kendra is a writer. Kendra is a writer. And I was like, I, I thought you wanted me to be Serena. But <laughs> like, I could never, ever be Serena ever in life. But he was trying to like mold me into that. And then I wrote that essay. And he just started telling people I could write. And I wanted to write about music. Like, I wanted to write about hip hop. And I wanted to write. Um, album reviews and then I went to college that wasn't working out and I went to a non creative nonfiction workshop and I was like oh I do this anyway like I talk about myself but I also talk about the world at once and that's what it's called like nobody ever knows what creative nonfiction is I didn't know what creative right. nonfiction was uh but I took that class with Kathy shout out to Kathy hey, um hey, Kathy. <laughs> and I took that class and then like I was just like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. You have, I'm like so grateful I had that moment where what I'm good at and what I, I'm passionate about aligned. And I'm like very, very grateful for that, yeah. Now you mentioned that you want to be hip hop writer. And I noticed in your book, the dedication is Joe Budden's Different Love. The song I listen to most when I needed help telling the truth about my thoughts and myself. I had to look that song up because I had no idea what song this was. Ooh. Why was this your go-to song? Okay, can I ask you a question? What did you think about this song? I'm embarrassed about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Honestly? Yeah. I'm not a big Joe Budden fan. I'm sorry, Joe Budden fan out there. But I kept looking for the, the chorus and I couldn't find one. Mm -hmm. So I just said, well, maybe it's just him telling his thoughts. And that's all I can say. That's <laughs> exactly that. I'm not a fan. I always make this disclaimer. Uh, I'm not a fan of Joe Budden as a person at all. I don't agree with a quarter of what he ever says. Um, but I do think he's a really good writer. And I think like that song for me was like an essay in mm. song form. And yeah. the honesty of it, um, like the self-implication of it all, the honesty of it, but also um, not being a... See, this is confusing because he's talking about Joe Budden. I'm talking <laughs> about Joe Budden, the artist. But the, um, the not being... I don't know. I just heard that song at a time where I never like heard nobody talk about like their emotions that kind of mm -hmm. way. And it, like you said, it's like no chorus. It's literally just bars of just like words. The entire songs in one verse. And he goes through so many different stories in one verse. And I was like really inspired by that. About uh, that at undergrad when I would write, um, I would listen to that song all the time to give me motivation to write because I'm just like okay, he's not scared to say like this kind of stuff. So like, I don't have to be scared to say this about myself either. And like parts of myself, I was like scared to put on a page. That song really helped me too. I love that. Love it. Now, speaking of your latest work, when you learn alphabet, you described it. This is what you gave me. <laughs> a bunch of mad stories about things you never learned to let go of. And it's a blend between personal narrative, cultural commentary, now, you touch on some really heavy issues in the book, from colorism, racism, police violence, relationships, fatherhood. Was there any part of that that seemed most challenging to you to write about? What was the hardest part? Um, I'm, 
I talk a lot. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I think like in general, when I'm talking to people, I immediately want to ask like those very personal questions mm -hmm. until I like get the answers. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do with this. Um, but I think the hardest part for me to write was definitely um, the about American marriage story and not the fact that like I was scared to write it because I'm like it's I just knew like the the outcome of writing this story what it would what it was gonna be and I think I was just trying to like prolong that process so I took a whole lot out of that essay and like I don't know I don't really know know how to talk about it um I think I think that was like the hardest essay for me to put out. It wasn't the hardest for me to write. It was easy to write. I think it was the hardest for me to be okay with like putting in the book. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. But I knew that was the essay that I needed to put in the book out of all of them. Because of like the little, like I'm talking about coming of age stories. And sometimes I just feel like, like we're all like kids and children. Mm -hmm. And like that was the essay for me that like probably I didn't realize form like a lot of my opinions and morale and integrity and stuff like that. Like that was the story that did that. Gotcha. Now, how old were you when you started writing your essays? Um, I was in, I was in college. I was just doing my homework. <laughs> um, I was probably like, when I started writing, probably like 19, I remember writing the title essay I remember exactly like when that idea came to my mind, where I was at, I was leaving a poetry workshop and I had another class in like three hours. I just sat in the hallway and wrote it. And I think that was the first draft. And I think that was like when I actually start writing the, the essays for the book. But I didn't know it was a book until like five years later. Yeah. So it took you a while to kind of pile it all together. How did you pick those essays to put together for a book? Um. Like I said, I think I was just doing homework. I didn't realize uh, at the time. I was I would get mad because I'm like, I keep writing about the same things. For those entire four years, I was just writing about the same thing. And I was like, dang, I ain't got nothing else to talk about. And when I went to grad school um, and I saw like that contest and I put it in um, and I just looked through all the work that I've done throughout the years and I was like, oh, I've been writing about the same thing for four years because it all goes together. Like, this is a collection. Mm -hmm. This all goes together. It wasn't on purpose. I don't know how to write a book on purpose. I'm struggling with that now. Um, but, yeah, it was really like a, a full circle moment of, like, I was not wasting my time talking about this. Um, and it all, like, really meant something that I didn't know it meant in the moment because I was just doing what I thought I had to do. Yeah. Mm, gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Well, some of your work is almost poetic, lyrical. Did you ever have a desire to be a rapper at all? Bars or something? <laughs> Did you have anything like Because some of it seems like a song, honestly. That is like the greatest compliment anybody ever has given me ever in life. Because I think I'm a rapper. I tell you people it. in my head, I think I'm a rapper. Like I can do this. Um, but I be hearing people rap. I be fixing their lyrics. I'm like, why you didn't say this instead of that? I can't rap though. I know I cannot rap. Um, okay, we'll but put you on the spot <laughs> I think I studied like the cra I appreciated study the craft of rapping and poetry as well. Like um so many poetic elements in rap um anyway like i'm always thinking how i can have like double entendres in my work double meanings uh metaphor like how i can work all these things in a non-fiction essay i'm always thinking about how i can do that um i also watch like all my heroes just have let me down uh, i also used to watch like a lot of deaf poetry jam russell simmons mm -hmm. deaf poetry jam um on youtube i used to watch black ice i think black ice was like my favorite on there and just the way that like he commanded a stage i wanted to do that in my work i wanted that to come through with just reading my work without me having to like stand up and like perform it i wanted it to feel like a performance and i think like rap and uh, things like that allows me to do that. So you've definitely done that with your work. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but a lot of people are comparing your writings to Keith A. Lehman. And his book, Heavy, <sighs> was heavy, yes. No book on earth compares to this book. And y'all gonna put some respect on Keith A. name because he's yeah. out here 
like miles ahead of every writer I've ever experienced. I don't understand how he's not winning every single award in life. I just don't get it. But that's just me. So he's one of your inspiration. Do you have any other authors that inspired you to write? Um, yeah. Um, I'm inspired by, it literally takes like a sentence for me to become a fan of you. Like if you write a sentence that is like so fire and I'm jealous that I didn't do it, I'm going to be a fan until like you show me I shouldn't be a fan. Um, but I'm very inspired by um, urban fiction. I hate that term, urban fiction, because yeah. that's kind of what I grew up reading was urban fiction. It, it wasn't it didn't feel performative. It was just like black people talking like black people. It wasn't trying too hard. It wasn't trying to sound smart to where it wasn't accessible to everybody, but it was still smart because we smart. Um, but I was like very inspired by Sister Soldier. I would read like all her midnight series, even though it's very problematic now that I'm older. I'm like, this book is problematic, but it's good. It's my problematic fave. Um, so I was reading like Sister Soldier. Um, I'm very, very inspired by Kiese Lehman, of course. I'm more inspired by songwriters, though. I think, like, look who? Who, like, right now, for instance, I love this artist named Jesse Reyes. Um, mm -hmm. I think she's so fire because she just does a lot. You have to listen to her. Um, Frank Ocean, as a writer, like, just even if I don't care about his albums, if I just sit down and read his lyrics, I'm like, this is art. Like, I don't need to hear the sounds because the sounds are coming through in these lyrics. Um, I'm very inspired by, it's this band called Daughter and the lead singer's name, Melina Tunra. I think that's how you say her name. Mm. So fire, like this girl be having me crying in the car. Um, <laughs> I like sad things. I like sad books and I don't even have to be sad. I just really like sad things. Um, films as well. I just watched this movie called Waves and I'm very, very inspired by this movie. Have you seen it? Yes, that's good. I've been thinking about the movie for weeks. If I'm riding in the car with you, you can play your sad playlist the whole ride. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> yeah. You're going to be like, why is this so deep? And I'll be like, bring my headphones. Bring my headphones. <laughs> I, was I, was, damn. Yes, I was like very inspired by Lil Wayne, but he can't shut up either. Like, I don't know. I'm inspired by any writer who does poets. I'm inspired by this poet named Nabila Lovelace. So far, it just happens to be one of my friends and it's like the best poet in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, she wrote this book called Sons of the Keelys and I read that book all the time to get inspired to write. I'm just random now, but I'm inspired by a lot of people. That's so crazy. That's so okay. And you are already inspiring people now, for sure, with your work that you're doing. So thank you. Keep it up. Keep doing what you're doing, for sure. Um, you touched a little bit in your book, really purposefully, it seems, on um, police violence, the media's tendency to look away and even the silence that your white roommates had when you were in school during the Ferguson Uprising. Um, I'd like to read an excerpt, if you don't mind, if I can read just a little excerpt from your book about your experience going to your school. Um, and it's truly representative, I think, of what many people in the Black community right now are feeling today, but on a larger scale. So if you bear with me, I probably can't read it like you can, but I'm gonna try. Let's see. It says, your answer questions, you answer questions asking whether or not you've personally been treated wrong by a white person. You answer questions about how much seasoning you put on your food, about your Afro when you take your weave out, about lotion, about perms, about everything you wouldn't have to answer if you went to a black college. You say it's okay to ask, you just mind you solely looked upon to represent an entire race. You mind that white people can represent themselves, but what they think of you specifically will be what they believe your entire race is like. Their questions sound like you people. And you mind, you have to give the correct answer, not your answer. You mind you have to be a collective voice. You hope they shiver when you speak. When I read that, I was, just like that, <laughs> just like that. Because those are the thoughts, especially now with the current events that are going on in Minneapolis. Are you almost moved to write more and kind of dig deeper into that topic? Because I know I've, I've recently read some things that you're very active uh, in the community and an activist and speaking up. 
Are you moved to write more about that or have you thought about it? Yeah, I definitely think about it every day. Like it's in our face. Like it's, it's hard not to think about anything else. Like that's kind of all I could think about at the moment. Um, but I also think, I'm like at a point where I'm going to talk about it regardless and I'm going to write about it regardless, but I'm trying to like have distance from it. I'm trying not to be so in the, like just reactive to the moment and like take time to like assess all angles of the situation before I sit down and get on the page. Because if I write it right now, she's going to be like very angry and like very sad which is fine, like fine feelings to have. I write everything out of anger. <laughs> um, it's okay to be angry. Yeah, like everything I've ever written started out of anger. So like, I, I understand that about like my process, but I think for some reason, like, I think this is like the consensus that this time it feels like different. It feels like, mm -hmm. I don't know, it just feels different than every other time black people have been killed. Um, I don't want to say that, that was like a weird thing. But it just feels like heavier, if that makes sense. I um, yeah, it just feels heavier. And so that's like taking an effect on me. And I want to be aware of like how I'm feeling in the moment where I'm not, I don't want, I don't want to feel, I'm thinking about what I'm trying to say, because I want to say the right, not the right thing, but the right way that I'm feeling about it, because I'll go back. Um, I don't want it to, I don't want like my like mental state to over, I want to take care of my mental state in this point. That's what I'm trying to say. I want to take care of my mental state in this point, but I also feel like pressure on social media to always answer and like have the answers for everything. And I want to have the, the ample time to take space and assess things for different situations. What I will say, is I always feel the need to speak out on like black trans women who are getting killed, I need to speak out on um, uh, black trans men who are getting killed. I think sometimes we center straight black men in this movement and a lot of black women are left out who are getting killed, Breonna Taylor for instance. Um, so I always wanna let that be known. I also wanna let it be known to care about black people who are, li who are still alive, who are struggling as well. Um, I think sometimes we get caught up in the sensationalized um, romanticism of like black debt um, and black suffering and black, um, just like black weight that's like on us at all times. And I don't want to romanticize that. I think that's what I'm trying to say in my right. I, I don't want to romanticize that because like, that's a very real thing and I want to um, humanize it. And I think like when I see social media doing everything or just like society in general doing everything to go around the fact of black people need to stop being killed by uh, state violence. Uh, we do everything instead of like stop killing black people. We try to like pacify black people with street names, things like that. And it's like, it's, it shouldn't be that hard to like not kill us. Like why we got to do all this and we still not, we still can kill like, yeah. So I don't know if I answer your question, but yeah. No, you did. You did great. It, you're fine. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with <laughs> okay. you. But you mentioned, you know, your mental health and making sure that you are taken care of. And I know you recently had an interview with the Dallas Morning News and you kind of touched on a little bit, but in your book, you even had wrote a part about um, your mother seeking mental um, assistance for care. And that's kind of taboo in the Black community. So is writing your therapy or what are you doing that can get you through this? Because everybody is wanting to know how can we just make it through each day? Yeah. Maybe picking up your book. I feel like um, back in the gap, back in the gap, uh, that's what my mama say. <laughs> um, I would say like writing and reading is my therapy, but no, therapy, therapy is my therapy. And I think every single person in the world should be in therapy. Kids should be in therapy. Mama should be in therapy. Everybody should be in therapy. Um, I started going to therapy like a, a year and a half ago. And that really has been helping me. Uh, my mom, she started going to therapy when I was younger and she'll go like little spurts at a time. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes she just go cause they make her go. And then sometimes, uh, but I see like, I see for me personally, knowing is my phone going off i'm so sorry yeah i think that's you 
sorry. I don't know okay. what that keeps coming through. Um, but I think um, for me personally, I had to like be aware of like how I'm feeling internally and like knowing what depression feels like in my body and knowing uh, when it's on the surface and knowing um, when I need to actually be in that therapy space, which is every single week. I haven't been in a few months because of the quarantine and I'm trying to get back as soon as possible. But I think um, writing does, I don't, I don't want to say writing is my therapy because that's like me romanticizing the act. Um, writing is my clarity, if that there makes sense. There you go, I love yeah. that. Because- let's the, say uh, therapy is now telehealth. Get your son. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I would say yes, let therapy be your therapy. Um, I think books and music and film and entertainment can be therapeutic but yeah. it does not compare to like actually doing the work yourself and like being prepared for like the years of like never ending work on yourself yeah, absolutely <laughs> absolutely now some of your work and all of our viewers they'll find out when they pick up your book and read it some of your stories almost seem so personal it's almost voyeuristic like i'm looking into your life I don't know about you, but I don't think my family would be too happy with me writing some of the things that you wrote. What was your family thinking? <laughs> okay, so um, my mama's side of the family, like we talk about this stuff. Well, me and my mama are like really close. So me and my mama just talk about this stuff naturally. So everything in the book, she wasn't really surprised. Like I've been telling her she has, she's homophobic for years. So she wasn't surprised on that. Um, I like everything in the book about her, like she she was like very proud, like super proud, like the proudest parent in the world about every single minuscule thing I've ever done. She's been like right there, like super proud. Um my granny, she like my granny's older, so like when I write things about white people, she like asks me things. She's like, uh, Kendra, you really feel that way about um, I wrote like in one of them essays. Um, I don't dislike white people, but sometimes they get on my nerves more than anybody else. <laughs> and she was like, Kendra, you really feel that about white people? And I said, yeah. And she said, girl, you're just crazy. You're just crazy. So <laughs> like I get questions like that. Um, I think it was like really hard on my dad to read this stuff about um, I would say about me, because it's more about me than it is about him, but um, I think he, like, took it more personally, but I expected that to happen, so I can't say, like, any reactions that I got from my family reading the book. Um, it was jarring, but it wasn't, like, unexpected or surprising. Like, I, I kind of know their personality, so, like, I know um, if sometimes they don't say things to me that I know they want to say, but I'm like, if you don't want to say it, then you just gonna be don't be mad because you ain't say it because I'm sad if I got a problem. Um, but yeah, yeah, those were it was weird. Okay. Okay. Well, speaking of your father, there's a portion in here that you say our men, our daddies, and the man we could not keep are all the same person. I'm gonna repeat this for y'all out there, our men our daddies and the man we cannot keep are all the same person tell me a little bit about that because that sentence in itself says a lot yeah um look don't get me started about like cis hetero black men um that's like a, a whole conversation but i can't say when i wrote that sentence i was like my rapper, my rapper head. I'm like, I am barred up out here. Like, I'm a rapper. <laughs> but that was like a moment where I had that feeling. And I think all I meant by it was like, who is going to show something different? Like, if all these issues are similar in this role of men, all different men who's supposed to mean different things, but like, it's the, the differences aren't visible like I don't really see a line I don't really see a difference I see the same um ideologies I see the same um kind of 
rigidness or like inability to receive criticism or like, but it's expected for me to like receive all the criticism. Um, I think what I just mean by that line uh, is people we cannot keep. One, you can't, uh, you can't have people like nobody is yours to keep. Um, your kids, they're yours, but like they're not yours. They're themselves before anything. Um, your partners are not yours to keep. Your um, your spouses, whoever, whatever you want to call it, like they're not yours. Um, but they're also. I think like we've been trained to sort of protect black men in a way that they have not been trained to protect us in a way. Um, I'm ranting again. I'm getting off topic. No, keep going. I'm listening. Bars, <laughs> bars. <laughs> I think um, sometimes um, they're all the same person because we treat our sons, our husbands, our partners, our uncles, our dads. Um, as one like we keep them as like small beings who cannot grow um and maybe that's like our fault is like black women um but i'm in like the business of reciprocity and um <laughs> and accountability um i'm really big on that and i think that line for me um was me realizing that like just letting it go like it's not for me to like stress myself over like um and I hate that phrase like men gonna be mad so I'm not saying that at all because I don't think men gonna be mad I think men need some accountability and to stick to it um and that's in terms of like patriarchal roles gender roles um all like things way bigger than just a relationship um but yeah I think that that line for me um we cannot keep it's just me allowing myself to be like, man, forget these people feelings. Like, forget. I want to say another word, but like, forget their feelings. Um, put you first. Um, because they put themselves first all the time. So I think that was like that moment for me. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely laid it all out there for sure. It in a beautiful way. Now, when you wrote this, you were a lot younger than you are now. When I hold that, because you're still young, but you were younger then. Do you still feel the same way? now is when you wrote that or what would you tell your younger self <clears throat> um I've been thinking about this a lot lately I would think I think I would tell myself in terms of like a few essays in that book I think I could I wish I could rewrite them like I wish I could rewrite them I, I feel like I know better words now uh to describe what I was trying to express um I think I know like the language to accompany like the ideas that I was trying to form in there. Um, of course, um, I think I would tell my younger self to uh, let it go now. I think I'll tell my younger self, let it go now. Mm -hmm. And writing this is not gonna allow you to let it go. Letting it go means like you actually, like, like I said, writing is not my therapy. Like writing is not gonna allow me to let it go. It's just gonna put it in my face more. So I think I would tell my younger self to um, let it go before you write it down. <laughs> there you go, there you go. To the world, not write it down like journaling, but writing it down for the world, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now you, you talked a little bit about uh, writing and how you were journalism major at first. How did you move to creative writing from journalism, even though it's still writing? Uh -huh. Journalism, creative writing, very different things. How did you get there? Um, learning that it was very different things. I think um, I took my first like intro to journalism. Like I said, I wanted to write about music. She wasn't trying to let me write about music. Uh, she had this idea of like, this is the one type of journalism. Um, you're going to get out here on these Chicago streets and talk to people. I'm like, I want to talk to rappers <laughs> and, she, and it wasn't connected like everything I would write for that class it had some sort of like opinion that I had or some sort of like um just like a personal narrative aspect to it mm -hmm. and it was creative nonfiction. I just didn't know the name of it and I think I went to my um uh, advisor I was like, I gotta change my major because this lady not finna keep giving me beads when I know my writing not bad. Um, <laughs> which is a whole nother conversation about you can't really grade. I don't I don't really believe in grading writing, but she was just giving me wild grades and I was like, I'm finna change my uh major and I changed it to music business and then I was also doing photography as like a minor. Okay. And um I changed it to music business and I took those classes 
And they was like, you got to take two math classes, two different types of math, accounting and something else. I was like, all right, we're going to change that too. What else can I do? <laughs> what else can I do? I didn't come to art school to do math. Um, <laughs> but I, I asked my advisor, I was like, I, I know I want to like, I was telling him I wanted to write about music. He was like, um, how you thought about creative writing? I was like, what is that? Like, what's creative writing? I didn't know anything about that. He was like, um, like writing fiction and stuff. I'm like, no, I don't write fiction. It's like, I can't do that. I love reading fiction, but I just can't write it. I want to try to write it one day, but I just can't. And he was like, what about creative nonfiction? I was like, what's that? He was like, it's um, just real stories and tell them. He didn't know how to explain it either. He was like, I'll put you in the intro class. And I took that intro class and then just changed my major from there. Yeah. Here we go. All right. Well, there was one essay that definitely uh, I know me and my best friend talk a lot about, and a few other people who had read your book. It's called Dark Girls and in Colorism. I think I'm disconnecting here. We're good? Yeah, back in. Okay, good. Um, yeah, it kind of touches on colorism. Without me reading the entire essay, would you mind giving people just a little bit of background on how that came to be and, and what it's focused on? Because that is a really poignant essay, I think, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the essays I wouldn't change if I could go back. I really am proud of that essay. Um, I think, well, I know, I can need to stop saying I think I'm working on that. I know, um, I know like I, wanted to write something about colorism for like a long time and I was trying to find like different entry ways to attack it. I was like, my family, personal essay, there you go. Uh, my dad's side of family, like they're all super light skin. Uh, I'm the darkest one in the family, but I only go there in the summers. And it would be like, um, just comments of like you getting dark or like, uh, you know, nickname chocolate, which I don't mind that nickname because it's from like, my auntie who's chocolate but um but yeah um it would just be things like that where when I'm little I'm just like why do you keep saying that like what's going on like why you like why you keep mentioning this like why you keep bringing this up um I know I look different but like why you keep bringing this up and I think sometimes we think of colorism as just like skin complexion mm -hmm. but colorism has like a lot to do with like featureism and like hair texture and stuff yeah. Don't even get me started on when they saw this. Uh, but <laughs> um, yeah, yeah um, so even when I was little, like being at, I was always out and like hanging around older people. I don't know why I'm in grown folks' business all the time. Oh, probably help me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'd be like at the wreck or like if I, or like boys be around, you know, boys. They preferences. Um, like they'll say things like, you pretty, but like, you pretty to be dark or like you pretty but you dark it's always like a, a caveat on yeah. it and I'm just like what's going on like why is that keep and I didn't know like the language for it I didn't know it was like colorism but I know I'm being treated differently because of like my color mm -hmm. and then also <clears throat> as I was getting older I would notice like little girls like staring at me um just little girls I look like them and um like I would see little girls, like I volunteered like this camp in the summer. I would see little girls there, like they cling to me. And like, you tell them they're pretty and you tell them things like that, like they don't believe it. They'd be like, no, I'm not. Or like, I'm ugly or things like that. And I'd be like, bro, like, dang. Like, I didn't know, like this affected me as a kid yeah. till I got older. So when I wrote that essay, I was just like, you know how deep colorism goes that we don't even realize like the anti-blackness of like everything and how white supremacy just permeates everything and it all it's all an extension of all of this and capitalism is us. I'm so sorry this phone is going off. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to stop it. Um but okay. I don't I just didn't know like dang like I've been in this family, not realizing, cause I don't be there all the time. I'm with my mama's side of the family where mostly everybody is my color. Uh, my mom was my color, uh, my uncle my color, my granny my color. So it's not an issue there, but why would I come here? It's brought up all the time. So I just wanted to like be honest about that. Um, not hide from that um, and say that and make sure 
I make a point to say like everybody is complicit in this. It's not just white people who are colors, it's black people who are colors. It's it's different things. Like I get different colorism from dark skinned black men than I do from light skinned black men who like fetishize me. Yeah, or, you a little bit about that in the book, like showing your arm colors. Yeah, it's a difference. And so I'm just like, I wanted to detail all that. Um I wanted to detail all that in a way that felt, I was thinking of rapping again, that felt- I'm gonna make you spit some bars, keep on. <laughs> that felt rhythmic. Like I'm thinking about like this flow all the time. So I'm really proud of that essay. Did you have someone in your family that reinforced that you are beautiful that, and kind of gave you that self-esteem boost that make you love who you are? Mm -hmm. um, my mama's side of the family for sure, like I feel, for sure, everybody. Um, my dad's side of the family, it wasn't just like, um, I think they all reminded me that I was beautiful, but the way that some people did it was like weird. It was unnecessary. Like it's weird. It's like, why, why does it have to be a uh, in spite of kind of notion to it? Um, I think, yeah, I think, yeah. Like my cousins, I always had my cousins around um, who like didn't make a big deal. It was always older people, it was always older adults who do this kind of stuff to children. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I definitely had people though. Uh, I never felt, that's what I mean by like I didn't understand it till I wrote it down because I never, I'm also like that. I'm very uh, not in tune with my emotions. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to work on that in therapy. So yeah, I'm okay. working on it. We all are. Yeah. So I don't really know um, that like something is affecting me to this certain extent until, until I don't know when. It's just a moment. And I think I had that moment later on. I knew I felt like funny whenever I would go to Houston and hear certain things, but I, I didn't like internalize. I internalized it, but I didn't know I was until like mm -hmm. later. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, if nobody's told you today, you are beautiful. Thank All you. you was out there, you are beautiful. So I'm are you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, like I, I'm not gonna keep. I'm gonna keep saying I love, love, love your book for sure. Um, there's we have about a few more minutes left on our time here. I don't want to take up too much of your time. We got plenty of things to do. But what advice would you give to aspiring writers that are looking at you and saying, I want to be a Kendra. I want to write like that too. I have stories. What would you tell them? Um, I would say um, read a lot. Read. Um, I know that's like a cliche that like good writers read, uh, but that's very true. Like you learn how to craft stories. You learn how to... Um, even if like you have a voice and you have like a story written down, it's a difference between just writing your story down. It's a difference between crafting it. And then um, I think that's like where the creative part of writing comes in where like you're crafting it, you're molding it, you're taking things out, you're putting sentences from 2007 next to a sentence from 2016 and it's still true, it still fits. And just knowing, trusting your instincts, I would say it's like very important. Um, don't be afraid to, put yourself out there. That's like easier said than done, but that's like my advice. Don't be afraid. Um, have somebody that you look to who you can ask questions. Don't be afraid to not know things um, about writing because writing is like a never ending lesson and journey. So don't be afraid to seek out people and reach out to people who could help you, who could guide you, who could read your work. Um, it's good to build a writing community. Um, of people, it could be two or three people that you trust with your work who can give you honest feedback and criticism. Also, be very, very comfortable with rejection because rejection is like super important. It's not oh. important, it's gonna happen. Um, like hundreds of times, not even like three times, but like hundreds of times. And just be okay with knowing it's not a reflection of the quality of your writing, it's more of a reflection of capitalism, it's more of a reflection of what they can sell is more of a reflection of did your piece fit into that literary magazine that they're constructing because they're also constructing something. So don't take it so personally. Just become comfortable with hearing no, but also drafting, redrafting, um, 
you're never like done with the piece. Like I said, I wish I can go back and rewrite half of those essays in that book because I feel like I can do it better. And I don't, it's not saying I don't, I'm not proud of it, but I know I can do it better. So always, um, always, I would say like my biggest advice for writers, because I, I still feel like I'm an inspiring writer. Um, but, yeah, you're going this way. <laughs> but yeah. I would say, um, just, just, keep the ideas flowing, like stay, stay consistent. I think reading, uh, taking inspiration from different places. Don't be afraid to experiment. Like we read so much of the same stuff, but if you're okay putting yourself out there, you can write the same thing in a different way and it can hit somebody a different way. Yeah. So yeah, that would be my advice. That's beautiful. Uh, speaking of reading, what are you reading right now? What's on your to be read list? I know you got a pile because I have plenty of piles. Everybody who likes to read has a pile of books that they gonna get to. I'm reading like 12 books right now. I'm not gonna lie. But <laughs> but the books, I'm like, I'm in the middle of like 10, but the books that I'm like focusing on right now uh, is this book called Three Women by Lisa Tadio. I took the cover mm -hmm. off, but it's by Lisa Tadio. It's called Three Women. Uh, and this is a book of nonfiction. Um, and it's about three women and like, how they talk about desire and sex and things like that because I'm working on something. So I'm using that for like inspiration. Also, I'm reading The Fortune for Your Disaster, which is a poetry collection, um, amazing poetry collection. Can I read you just like one line from this book? Yeah, please do. And um, shit, I want to keep that. <laughs> <laughs> he said in this book, look, let me tell you how I've been thinking about this line. He says, everybody want to make soul, but don't nobody want to hemorrhage a whole family. And I just been thinking about this line for days because I'm like, first of all, you attacking me and you don't know me. You don't know what I'm writing through. <laughs> but like, <laughs> I just been thinking, I'm going to write this down and like put it on my wall in front of my desk because it's really in my head, especially I'm working on a memoir and it's about like family and desire and things like that. So I'm trying to read books that are like, make it not easy, but like give me an entryway to talk about it in a different way. Now I heard little Birdie told me that she was writing a book of poetry. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's, it's uh, called the Collection Plate um, <laughs> and it'll be out next summer uh, from Echo Press. Um, and it's like technically done. I'm working on like the final draft right now and like turning that in, but it's same thing. It's called collection play. Uh, I grew up in my great uncle's church, uh, a Baptist church, a black Baptist church in Pleasant Grove. And I was there every other day of 16 years of my life. So, um, it's about religion and it's about like the questioning of organized religion, of gender and sex roles in religion. Um, it's about um, the religious sense of like the collection plate being passed around, but mm -hmm. also things that like been collected from me, whether that's like through debt or um, loss or desire or um, cultivation of ideals about desire and sex and sexuality. I think I'm like really, really like zoned in on writing about like desire right now. And any way I can talk about it um, from like a coming of age standpoint okay. um i want to try to figure that out so the collection plate really discusses like sex religion um death um punishment and things like mm -hmm. that in a way where i'm really in my rapper bag on this i'm not gonna lie like i've been listening hey. to a lot of rap and i'm like i'm finna kill the game with this they gonna have to put this on the album y'all gonna stop disrespecting me out here y'all you need to get you a spotify playlist and put it <laughs> in the book yeah so i try to like, make playlists for real i make playlists for real to like talk about songs that like inspired this writing so yeah love it love it love it. well you're already going places i can't wait to read your book of uh poetry i can't wait till all that Five, 10 years from now, where do you see yourself being or where would you like to go? I know some writers aspire to be, have their books put on the big screen or plays. Do you have that kind of uh, aspiration or? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I have a lot of aspirations. Um, I think you said five to 10 years. I definitely want to be writing for a living. Like I want that as my job. 
Um, but I also want to get into voice acting. I watch a lot of cartoons. I want to do voice acting. And I'm thinking about like all my life. I'm about um, to do voice right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think all my life, like I had to repeat myself a lot, even like being from Texas and people think I'm country, but even like my friends in Texas will be like, what? Like what you say? Like what? Like, I can't understand you. Uh, my daddy said I sound like a road runner. So, like, I want to, like, I don't know what you just said. You just said a whole lot together. Um, so, I really want to, like, get into voice acting, but I also want to um, work on, like, the, the memoir that I'm working on in five to ten years. I really want to see that as, like, a, a television series, and I want to, like, direct it and write it and you know, do all the stuff, the Lena okay. Dunham stuff. Like Michaela Cole. Have you been watching I May Destroy You? Like she yes. writes, directed. Yes. Um, I don't know if I want to act and star in it, but I definitely want to be involved with like the writing and direction of it. Uh, so hopefully like that could be something that I can explore in five to 10 years. Now, a lot of the pieces that you write about, because they're such heavy topics, you often need like a whether it's mental health specialists or resources for people to connect to. Are you affiliated with any nonprofits or do you, um, have you ever thought about connecting with some of the nonprofits? Because I could think of plenty of organizations that would love to speak with you or hear from you. Um, I'm definitely interested and please send me that list of uh, organizations. I think because I've been not settled in the space for the past seven or so years. No, I have not been. And like, I really want to get into like nonprofit. I really want to work with uh, like uh, girls in like the juvenile system. Okay. I think like that would be, uh, I want to like offer them free books, um, talk to them. Um, I think I'm just like really interested in like anything black woman related. Um, and I really like, if you have any nonprofits that you can send me, send them to me. Um, I would love to reach out. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm not right now. No. Okay. Now, speaking about reaching out, I know everybody is quarantined at home, COVID-19. You can't do your book tours and things. How are you telling people about what you're doing? How are you getting to where that, besides talking right here? <laughs> um, thankfully, people um, like you who are like reaching out to me and like just being like opening your platform to me. Um, I'm big on Twitter. I'm not that big on Instagram. I'm on it like once every three months. I've been on it all week this week and it's exhausting. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, okay, I can do this. I can push through. But I'm on Twitter a lot. Um, I think word of mouth has like, I've been like super, super blessed with people who's uh, been um, supporting and like sharing my work and talking about my work in spaces where I I would never think like my name would be in that room with like these people. So I've been like very fortunate and blessed. Um, like I said, finding people who answer those questions for you. Um, I've been very grateful to have like mentors and things like that. Um, who's taught me like how to promote, like I, I don't, I, it's, it's hard for me to like overly promote my stuff a lot. Um, and that's probably like just an entitled thing of like they'll figure it out. Like I, I posted it once. <laughs> it's still a business. <laughs> yeah, like I, I I need to think about it like that. It's real hard for me to do. So um, yeah, I'm learning that it is a business, and I I should I should not stray away from like um, displaying my accomplishments. I really gotta get that out of my head that like that means I'm bragging or that means I'm doing something mm -hmm. or I'm like showboating. When really it's just like hey, how, how's anybody going to support if I don't put it out there? That makes no yes. sense. Shine on, shine on. <laughs> yeah, That's so I'm like just trying to work through that. I'm trying to be more active on that end because if I'm tweeting, I'm just tweeting about something that's happening and not what I should be tweeting about. Okay. Well, I have a question from an audience member. They want to know, what are you putting in your hair? Because your hair is gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I use uh, Jamaica... Uh, all in all, Jamaica mango and um, what is that thing called? It's from Walmart in the beauty supply store. Um, Jamaican mango, Jamaican mango and lime um, island island serum thing, and I just like keep it moisturized. That's really all I use in my hair. I'm not gonna lie, like I just keep it moisturized. I know I'm loving the natural. <laughs> I'm a year in. I'm loving it. Loving you look beautiful. It. Thank you. Thank you. So do you. But we're almost out of time. I definitely want to um, find out 
besides your book of poetry, you mentioned a memoir. Mm -hmm. What is this memoir going to cover? Can you give us a little sneak peek into the memoir? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's it's like the thing I'm most excited that I've ever written. Um, it's called Fruit Punch at the moment. Um, I don't know what that means, but it just felt like the right title for this. Um, and it's a coming of age memoir, like a childhood memoir of um, like just talking, discussing. First, I'm using like Dallas as a map. And like I said, I grew up like in the Oak Cliff area, like all my friends and stuff. And it was like in a block area of like maybe four or five blocks of like area. My great grandmother lived over there and then it was the wreck, and then it was school, and then it was my friend dad's house, and then it was like all this stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm using that as like the basis for the memoir. And it's basically about how three generations of like my women in my family, me, my mom and granny, like existed in the same exact space and how we learned like, um, desire, sexual trauma, um, things like that, um, love, sexuality in the same space and how like these things have been passed down through like generations. But also I wanted to be like showing the joy that I felt growing up in this area. Like it's literally like a great childhood and I want to like display like all these people, the most talented people I ever met, funniest people I ever met, just like all around great people mm -hmm. who like existed in this space who I would like love forever. And I want them to like exist in like my story as well. Really big on childhood stories. So yeah, it's a childhood memoir about Dallas. I love it. I love it. Sounds good. I don't know why I'm picturing on my head a, a photo of Daughters of the Dust and all the white linen and you and your mama and your grandmama. I that movie is fire. And yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because my favorite movie ever in the world is Ease by You. And like I think of Ease by You every single day of my life. And it definitely inspires everything I write. So yeah. Well, see now, now we know. Y'all hear that? You know her faves. You know her books. How can people get in contact with you? How can people find you? Um, I'm asking now. I'm on everything. Uh, all social media. Kendra, can you? Kendra, C A N Y O U. Uh, email is C A uh, Kendra C A N Y O U. Um, you can find me on any of those. You can really find me on Twitter. Of you message me on Instagram. I might message you like two weeks later, but that's just because I didn't see it. Um, mm. But um, yeah, you can reach out to me anywhere. I'm usually uh, very friendly. I smile a lot. Anybody can tell you like sometimes I should not be as nice to some people as I am, but that's just something I'm unlearning too. So yeah. <laughs> hey, if that's a part of you, be you. <laughs> Love it. Well, we have a little bit of time left. Um, we're going to wrap it up here, but I want to leave everybody here with a quote. Um, I'm a big James Baldwin fan, like love James Baldwin. So I'm going to leave you with one of his quotes. He says, our crowns have already been paid for. We only need to put them on. And I definitely say you are wearing your crown proudly. Yes. And keep, keep it up. Keep it up. So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today. I want to thank all you bookmaker fans out there for joining us. We have a good following and hopefully continue to share and like. Um, our website, bookmaker.org, is up and active, point one version. So keep an eye out. There'll be more updated information coming out. Um, there'll be events. So continue to follow, like, share our pages. We're on Facebook, Instagram. Yeah, Facebook, Instagram, and definitely our webpage. Sign up and subscribe. And uh, feel free to follow up with us. And hopefully we can get you back again, Kendra, when your next collections come out. Anytime, anytime. Thank you so much for having Thank you. Y'all support Book Mecca. This is amazing. Um, Bookmecca.org. I got that right. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Literally, anytime, uh, just email me text me whatever it is all right thank you thank you again if i had an audience i'd clap <laughs> we can clap for ourselves thank you. <laughs> thank you thank you thank you love you guys and y'all have a great night bye, bye.